Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Sequel Bits 2020. This is the greatest data show. <laughs> Fantastic, and thank you for joining me here uh, on Saturday, of course, the greatest of Sequel Bits days, uh, for my session. Um, you're, you're too kind, you're too kind. Uh, that is, of course, stop that. Stop that. What does compliance mean for development? Now, I'm talking compliance specifically with laws and legislation. I'm not talking about other types of compliance. And uh, many other sessions on that exist online. Go, you research. It's fine. It's fine. It's all good. But we're going to be talking about legal compliance uh, and, and data, of course. So who am I? Why should you be listening to me? What is the point? Hey, who's this guy? Uh, well, my name is Chris Unwin. And I am a solutions architect for Redgate. I'm also a blogger at plantbasedsql.com. Uh, I realized that some of my blogs have, um, or I've been failing to post the last couple of weeks. That is because I've been piling all of my effort into getting this beautiful presentation done for you, the wonderful people of the world, the wonderful people coming to me direct at SQL Bits. If you want to connect with me, please do. I love new friends, new acquaintances. I love talking to you about everything from how do I remain compliant? How do I, you know, spin up non-production environments all the way to, hey, Chris, do you have a good recipe for Alu Gobi? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Uh, so please do feel free. Add me on uh, Twitter. I am at Plant Based Sequel. Add me on LinkedIn. I really don't mind. There's no link there on the slide, but, you know, go ahead anyway. Uh, I also present a podcast called DB Ale. Um, it's actually a Redgate sponsored podcast uh, that I present with a colleague of mine, uh, Chris Kurzweil. We are the two Chrises, and that podcast is basically nothing but uh, data and beer. So if you're interested, go along and check it out. Uh, DBL is on Spotify. It's also on Apple Podcasts. It's on uh, the Redgate Hub. It's on all number of different places. You'll find it. It's fine. Uh, and I'm also an avid lover of data masking, uh, static data masking to be specific, but all things data masking really, including uh, dynamic and of course data synthesis as well. So actually all, all the important ways of protecting data, uh, but more on that later. Uh, of course, I am known uh, by some as, uh, as that data masking guy, one of my chief highlights from past summit last year, back when, you know, we were able to uh, do an event in person. What are in-person events, I hear you say? Well, those were the days. Uh, but yes, uh, the highlight of my career, I was pointed out, hey, look, it's that data masking guy. Uh, but some of you may be thinking, he doesn't quite look the same. Yes, I have lost some weight. Thank you. Thank you for noticing. Anyway, on to more serious things. Uh, the goal of today's session. So what is the goal of today's session? Well, hopefully, we're going to understand some key common aspects of global data protection laws. You know, what, what do they have that's similar? What actually brings them all together and allows them to harmonize? Um, and we're going to be able to describe 10 steps that can help us build our own defensible position. And we've got about, well, we've got about 45 minutes to do this. Hopefully we'll We'll be on time and I'll be able to get you all out for the rest of the uh, the wonderful learnings uh, that we've got going. But uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed we'll all learn something, including myself. Um, so first things first, hold up. Defensible position. What do I mean by defensible position? Well, what I mean by a defensible position is that a position that you build up from the ground, it is a non kind of prescriptive thing. Effectively, by building yourself up a mountain, and what I mean by that is a number of, um, of guidelines, controls, processes, basically building everything in from the ground up to give yourself a mountain to stand on, that becomes a position that is defensible, i.e. you can say, hey, I have done nothing wrong. And that is not equivalent to a checkbox exercise, okay? Now, when we talk about defensible positions, we talk about some of the things that you can do to help protect data during the development life cycle. 
And what I don't mean by that is that any of these pieces of regulation we'll talk about today are checkbox exercises like, say, ISO 27001, Cyber Essentials, Europrize. Okay, these things are all very much things that you can very easily get certified in. But when it comes to regulation, there is still an element of gray area. You can be compliant with regulation, but you can still not do enough to be compliant with it, if that makes any sense. But one thing that I should, of course, mention, and a lot of people, a lot of you will already be thinking this, but naturally, yes, these checkbox exercises that you can do, things like ISO 27001, things like Cyber Essentials and Europrize, those sorts of things can still be used to help you build that defensible position because that is effectively evidence that you are already starting to care about data and that you're already starting to uh, do what you can to protect what data you have and therefore you can defend your position. So I've already mentioned a couple of things there. One of the key things I mentioned is sensitive data. Um, it all comes down to sensitive data, really. And, and what is sensitive data? Well, um, you know, no, this this isn't really uh, a sensitive data. I'm not fat. I'm big data. Uh, fortunately, I don't mean that at all. No. What we mean by sensitive data, and I do always like to start out with... Um, with just a definition, of course, we all know what sensitive data means. Or, or do we? Well, interestingly, it encompasses a whole range of different things. And they're often grouped or categorized in lots of different ways um, that sometimes encompass each other, but are still used semi-interchangeably, but also specifically for certain regulations. So the primary one, the one that I hear a lot of customers talking about is PI or PII, okay? And that is personally identifiable information. That includes things like telephone numbers, geographic data, like addresses, um, it, you know, IP addresses, all these sorts of things, um, credentials, contact information, email addresses, standard, anything that you can use to identify an individual. Uh, in some cases only living, in some cases living or dead. Some regulations do care about the dead as well. PHI is protected health information, and that's generally your more unsurprisingly uh, health-oriented uh, data. So things like uh, biometrics, uh, your fingerprints, your eyes, any history of diseases, how you've been treated, basically a lot of the records that um, health or health plan um, insurers or hospitals may hold on you. In the UK, for instance, we've got the National Health Service, the NHS, and they will hold a lot of PHI and PII. There's also payment card information. This is another one, again, unsurprisingly relates specifically to payment cards like credit cards, debit cards, etc. Um, that's kind of a separate thing that we'll talk about. Um, maybe we'll see how we get on. But effectively, uh, it's still a type of PII and still very sensitive information that is protected by regulation. Not, a, not necessarily a regulation that's been brought in by specific countries or governments, but there you go. That's just the, the nature of this wilderness. The important thing to bear in mind is that this information, like I said, can exist in lots of different categories. Uh, a lot of the definitions of protected health information do encompass a lot of contactable, personally identifiable information as well. So there's actually a ton of ways that these things are included. Now, how are we protecting data in the first place? Well, unfortunately, uh, data breaches are an all too common occurrence. And if you've ever seen me speak before, if you've ever, I don't know, been to any one of the, I mean, there's several vendors sponsoring SQL Bits. Th massive thank you to all the vendors who are sponsoring SQL Bits as well. Couldn't do this without you. Um, but a lot of them will talk to you about the security of um, your systems as well. And one of the primary reasons is that we need to protect our systems. We need to protect our information. Why? Well, because people want that information, okay? And not just, we're not just talking kind of external, um, you know, these people who are trying to break in, you know, your traditional hacker man from the movies, uh, effectively the sorts of people who, uh, you know, 
hack the system, breach the firewall, steal your data, etc., etc. That can happen, and you can definitely be at the mercy of those people. But it can also come from internally as well. Um, just technical debt, legacy systems, poor systems integration, poor provisioning of pre-prod environments. We'll get onto that as well. But there's a ton of reasons why sensitive information can often uh, end up in places that it shouldn't. Um, and we've already seen this happen. Uh, uh, fortunately for me, I had a whole slew of things to choose from. I had a billion different options. Um, and I've just picked three of kind of the more famous ones here. So you've got uh, Marriott, MySpace, Equifax, um, quite a few records. Um, if you don't already follow uh, data breaches or you don't already have kind of insight into if your personal details have been um, compromised, then I would highly recommend checking out um, HaveIBeenPwned.com, uh, which is owned and operated by Troy Hunt. And, you know, big shout out to that because not only does it have great suggestions on how to protect yourself, like password managers or, you know, having longer passwords as opposed to necessarily just kind of complex short passwords, ton of different options there, but it also does a lot of the scanning and checking and notification for you to um, help keep you on top of any breaches that may happen. As an example, I knew about my details being included in the Canva data breach uh, before, in fact, Canva still haven't reached out to tell me that that was the case, um, but I knew from Have I Been Pwned, so I would, would highly recommend. But there needs to be something that protects the rights of these people. And naturally, there are. In fact, there's quite a few of them as well. Uh, so there's a lot of different regulations that help us with protecting information. Uh, if you want to check this graphic out, there's a very interactive map that you can move around and click into from DLA Piper. Uh, it's their data protection laws of the world map. And effectively, uh, you can see that we've got quite a few, you know, heavy and robust laws on there, quite a few with no data. Um, but just some examples, we've got HIPAA, GDPR, California Consumer Privacy Act, the, uh, the catchily named uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, who have their NIST 853, I think revision five uh, coming out or queued to come out to be enforceable. Tons of different regulations that we care about. But what do all of these privacy laws care about? Well, we'll talk about a few of the commonalities between those different regulations, but there is one overarching thing that these different regulations care about. And that, of course, is you. <laughs> Plain and simply, they care about you, they care about me, they care about data subjects. Now, Let's just uh, roll back and have another definition there. Uh, so what is a data subject controller processor? Not all of you will, will necessarily have heard some of these terms before. They are very, very uh, legal terms. Um, but in general, and again, this is very in general because it does vary. Some regulations talk about households. Some talk about citizens versus nationals versus you know, there's all lots of different um, phrasing and wording differences. But in general, a data subject is that kind of end user, that person for whom the data is gathered about. That is the me, that is the you, that is the anyone who has information gathered for providing some kind of good or service. Now, that data is generally... Um, collected by data controllers. These are the people who generally collect information. So uh, that could be, for instance, the company that you work for gathering your data. They're a data controller for you. Um, they're maybe uh, selling a good or a service. Let's pick Redgate, for instance, my employer, the people who, uh, who actually sell software to help people make uh, database changes way easier. Um, and, you know, obviously they are a data controller as well for anyone they sell software to so that we can look after licenses and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you also have this idea of a data processor as well. And a data processor can be someone who 
it either exists within the same company or a different company who actually then does some processing of that data for a purpose. Um, that could be analytics, it could be marketing, it could be X, Y, Z, it really doesn't matter. Um, a good example of data processors would be someone like MailChimp, quite a famous kind of marketing email based company um, who naturally then email back spe on specific campaigns to specific people, specific data subjects um, on behalf of the data controller. And generally this means that uh, there needs to be quite good kind of communication between the controller and the processor, um, not just to protect data, but at least to provide that service in the first place. Oftentimes, of course, those can be the same company as well. So um, any massive company, let's pick a good example. How about, um, ooh, Google. That's a good example. Uh, so Google are actually both a controller and a processor in some uh, senses. So naturally they fall under certain um, certain regulatory requirements themselves. If you ever if you ever fancied it and you really want a good kick just before bedtime, um, I would highly go and recommend the uh, the data processing guidance on Google's um, on Google's page actually, and what it tells you that they do with your data, how they are a data controller, how they're a processor, etc. Um, it's actually really really interesting. Um, just like reading the terms and conditions, because we all read the terms and conditions, of course. <sighs> Anyway, so let's have a th let's have a talk about some of these legislation. Okay, so we've all heard about some of them. There are a few very very famous ones that have affected, well, a lot of people globally. And one of them, you know, one of the most important regulations that has been passed in the last few years, um, and has taken the world by storm, really, and is uh, commonly featured in the news very, very often, um, but is also generally the, the the stick in the ground, the stake that people plant to try and help with uh, compliance with other regulations. So we'll start with the key one, that's the GDPR. So the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, and it's going to feel like I'm playing a bit of, um, uh, of like cards, I don't know the word in lots of different... Um, languages for this but uh like a top trumps game it's like date introduced 25th of may 2018 oh i've got 20th of may 2017 all right you win those cards um we call that top trumps in the uk uh in any case date introduced 25th of may 2018 so it was introduced about uh not even about about it was two years ago um and uh, it was introduced in the european union and and the european economic area and it basically protects the sensitive data of european citizens so that's pii phi uh pci as well um and the maximum fine for the gdpr to try and help protect uh information in the sense that it dissuades uh, dissuades companies from having lax security around sensitive information well of course the maximum fine for that is 20 million euros or four percent of annual global turnover so just for some uh, just for background there that could be you know the, the moment you um, go with someone like McDonald's or Microsoft or XYZ you know these are massive companies these are people who make a lot in annual global turnover and therefore their fine would be well it would be um let's just say not pocket change and the important thing to remember here is it's whichever is bigger whichever is larger as well so if you make um let's say you make 50 million euros uh, a year as turnover because that is because that is great because that is potentially going well no say you make 5 billion euros per year then naturally uh, your 4% of annual global turnover is going to be significantly larger. So unfortunately, you're going to be um, in a bit of a sticky wicket. <laughs> uh, there's Papia. So reasonably reasonably new, actually, brand new in South Africa. Uh, you've got the, personal, uh, the you know, Protection of Personal Information Act there. And it's effectively, it came into uh, force on the 1st of July 2020, but actually has a, a year grace period. And um, again, that protects any personal data of South African citizens and residents. And uh, the maximum fine, although it's not a huge sting in the tail, I mean, it's still significant, is you know, 10 million South African rand. 
Um, but that does also include 12 months imprisonment as well for the right actors within the company. So again, that one's got a bit of a sting in its tail. Another one, another very famous one that a lot of uh, a, a lot of Americans are talking about as well, of course, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and that was effective as of the 1st of January 2020 and was introduced in California. Um, and it relates to the personal data of Californian residents and households. Again, I told you there's a lot of gray area there. Um, there's a lot of different regulations saying different things. But, you know, mostly we're talking Californian residents. Yeah. And the maximum fine for that one is interesting because it's uncapped and it's uh, up to $7,500 per violation for intentional violation. So if someone intentionally, uh, I don't know, if someone intentionally breached 100,000 uh, different records of, uh, of Californian households, then you're looking at $7,500 per record for those 100,000, 100 million records. It's going to be quite a few, okay? And I'm not even sure there are 100 million households in uh, in California, so maybe dis disregard that one. Um, but again, because it's uncapped, it can really be uh, quite painful. And the important thing to note is that we've looked at the GDPR, we've looked at PAPIA, we've looked at the California Consumer Privacy Act, and they're all fairly big pieces of regulation that everyone's heard about. But there's more. Uh, in fact... Not only is there a bunch more, you've got PIPA, PIPEDA, you've got a whole bunch of different regulations in um, Australia, for instance. They have a whole mesh of different privacy laws by state. Russia, China, the UAE, for instance, uh, there's a whole bunch. So what did these bring about? They didn't just bring about data protection. They brought about a new era for data protection. And whilst some of these are a little more prescriptive in that they tell you how you should protect information with de-identification, etc. None of them specifically tell you 100% do all of these things and you will be compliant. So it's quite difficult to do that, um, especially across the board, especially where you as a company sell into multiple global geographies as well. But what do all, okay, maybe 99%, let's take it with a, a pinch of salt, but what do they all have in common? What's something similar between all of these different pieces of regulation? Well, the common principle number one is purpose limitation. So they effectively tell us, hey, you can collect data, but only for a very specific purpose and you have to be explicit about what and why you are collecting it. It's in the GDPR, it's in Papier, it's in the CCPA, it's in a bunch of different regulations. There's just a couple of them. And it tells us, hey, you need to limit the purpose you're collecting this information from. And you know, if you need it for more stuff, then you need to widen your definition. People need to know why you are using their data that you've collected. Common principle number two, process minimization. So you actually have to limit the processing. This kind of leads on from the last one. So if you have a purpose for that data, if you're providing a good or a service and that is all you have declared as you are providing uh, in you know exchange for that data, you need that data to do a thing. Well, you need to limit what you do with it to that given purpose, to that minimum. Again, GDPR, DIFC law number five, um, you've got LGPD, all of these different uh, regulations. Again, they say minimize what you're processing to the given purpose. Uh, number three common principle is confidentiality and integrity. Now, this is a big one that a lot of them really, really like to highlight, unsurprisingly. But they all say ensure complete security. They don't necessarily say exactly how, but ensure complete security of the data during processing activities and minimize the risk of unauthorized access. And that's the key here, right? A data breach is more specifically about unauthorized access. It's about people seeing that data who shouldn't. As we know, the deep web makes up, or the deep and the dark web make up basically most of the internet and actually what we can search is just barely scratching the surface. 
But the last thing we want to do is actually open that up a bit and have people accessing this information. So we need a whole bunch of controls in place to help us protect this information. Common principle number four, um, accuracy. This is an often overlooked one, I think. Um, but a lot of people forget with most of these regulations, you also need to make every possible effort to keep data up to date and relevant. Any old or outdated data should be rectified or deleted as soon as humanly possible. Wow, now that is a task. If you think if your customer's database has got mm, 1.5 million customers in it, how do we ensure that we're keeping information up to date? And that's not even to mention our semi-structured and unstructured data. That's a whole different kettle of fish. Uh, number five, bonus common principle, uh, <laughs> accountability. And a lot of the regulations really, really love pointing this out. Prove it. Show us how you are doing it. They don't want to know. They don't want you to tell them, oh, hey, I'm protecting data. This is how they're like, oh, OK. Prove it. Show us the controls. Give us the reports. Give us the output. Tell us how you are protecting data. And then, of course, show us how you're protecting data. So we need to figure out how we can prove it whilst also protecting it. So what do we have to do? Well, again, I'm being unfair to the regulations here. Some of them do tell us what we need to do. It's fairly straightforward. I think you'll agree. Now, there's a lot that you can read here. Uh, I'll, I'll wait. There you go. <clears throat> Done? Yeah, me too. Uh, no, but seriously, look at all of these. So let's pick just a couple of them. Um, let's pick the top one. So security. Use of technical and administrative measures uh, which are able to protect personal data from unauthorized accesses and accidental or unlawful situations of destruction, loss, alteration, communications, or dissemination. I know, representative of Keats, of Byron, of Shakespeare. Uh, let's go for the let's go for the um, I'm gonna go with the third one. A responsible party must secure the integrity and confidentiality. Again, going back to those common points I talked about. Um, confidentiality of personal information in its possession under its control by taking appropriate, reasonable, technical and organizational measures. Interesting. Now, a lot of these regulations are quite dry. I'm not going to tell you to go away and read every single one of them because, quite honestly, I haven't. I made it through the GDPR and that was like wading through a very, very thick custard. Um, my eyes were fighting with me saying, you want to go to sleep? And my brain was saying, no, you've got to read it. And I did. And then I immediately forgot half of it uh, in the next hour. But a lot of these pieces of regulation talk about building a defensible position by taking sufficient technical and organizational measures. So this is the big question. What does compliance mean for development? Well, they specifically call out technical and organizational measures. But what happens when you combine technical and organizational measures? What do you actually get? You get a good process. So to turn to one of my favorite speakers on this particular point and one who I will talk about uh, until I am blue in the face, until, well, until he no longer considers DevOps a thing. But I'm going to turn, of course, to Donovan Brown, the uh, principal DevOps uh, manager at Microsoft. And Donovan says, DevOps is the union of people, processes, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to end users. And he's absolutely right. It's all baked into the process. It all is one, effectively. So if we take what we already know, we've been talking about DevOps for years. If you haven't been told about DevOps or you haven't done research about DevOps, if you haven't implemented DevOps or a good database change management process, we should probably be clear, you know, DevOps is a whole world. And if I say, oh, if you haven't done DevOps, you know, then we'll get all of the people on Twitter going, 
Chris. How could you say if you haven't done DevOps? Nobody does DevOps. Um, no. You put in place a good change management process. And it looks a little bit like this. Naturally, we're all familiar with this nice infinite cycle. Okay, Chris, we're all very agile. We're all very iterative. We're all very synergistic management solutions. What are you actually saying? Well, we all know what DevOps is. And there's a lot of people out there who love this particular term. And this is what I'm going to talk about. But DevSecOps. Okay, I'm going to leave that with you for a second. DevSecOps. There's also DevPeopleOps. There's Dev um dev data ops there's you know there's devops everything but this is the thing i should point out is that it's all just a type of devops now a lot of people will disagree with me with that one and again i welcome your opinion this is my opinion uh but everything is just devops we just evolve it have you ever seen those toothpaste commercials where all of a sudden someone brushes their teeth and they go Wow, I've been using this particular brand of toothpaste for two months now, and now look at my teeth. And they've become super hard because they've, I don't know, firmed up with all of that uh, fluorine or whatever's in toothpaste. I don't know. I, I talk about data, not toothpaste. But effectively, that's what we need to do to DevOps. We need to stick something on it. We need to effectively uh, wrap it in security so that security just becomes part of DevOps. Now, you can call it DevSecOps. You can call it DevOps with security from the beginning. The point is security, uh, much like the regulation was saying, significant technical organizational measures built in at every single stage. So without further ado then, here are 10 tips from me to you on how to build your own defensible position from a development standpoint. How do we ensure that our developers, you know, how do we ensure that our developers are happy and that they're able to not slow down but be compliant with data legislation? Number one and, uh, you know, numbers numbers one, two, and three are probably my favorite on this list. Okay, so, you know, I'll everyone grab your pen. I'll sit up. Uh, but these are quite important. <clears throat> so identify where your data is. Now that seems like a pretty obvious one. I see Chris. Okay, come on. You've lured me in here with the promise of 10 steps that I can take. Uh, it's like seeing the little banner ads on websites saying, you know, dentists hate her figure out her i don't know why i'm so teeth focused today but dentists hate her figure out her secret in 10 easy steps okay it's surprisingly simple but it's one that many of us actually miss off uh identifying where data is gathering an inventory of everywhere that sensitive data exists and could be used by developers or indeed anyone within the company old backups stored on network drives their prime real estate. Old, forgotten, disused instances and servers wherever they exist. People maintain Excel sheets filled with, oh yeah, I know where all of our instances are. Here are the connection details and everything. And it's years out of date. People forget the number of times I've heard people say on calls, oh, I didn't know we had that. Oh, that's interesting. Nobody knows necessarily, unless, you know, it's a reasonably small company, but... Not every company has a 100% picture of everything it has because people be crazy. People be trying to play with things. You know, if you asked anyone in, uh, if you asked anyone at Redgate, hey, you know, do you know exactly where all of your Azure SQL DBs are? Um, or do you know of every instance of SQL Server running within the company? They might not know because I have Express installed on my machine. I have Developer installed on my laptop. Um, with, you know, adventure works and all these, um, I'm not holding sensitive information, but still people can install it if they have admin permissions on their local machines. You never know where a copy of SQL is going to end up and there, as an extension, a copy of the database. Now, to extend this point even further, identify what your data is and what is at risk. Now, these two points I've mentioned together because they are intrinsically linked they are 100% basically the same point because one naturally leads into the other. You cannot protect what you don't know you have. 
one of the biggest points. It's like playing capture the flag, but you don't know where all the flags are. You think there's one and it's over in Germany, when actually there's two more and one of them's in Australia and one of them's in Colombia and they're different colours, different sizes. One of them's hidden in a trunk under a bed. How are you supposed to get them? Nobody knows, but you don't care because you still only think there's one flag. Know what you have. Describe what you have. Create a new way of discussing data you hold across the organization and understand what is at stake each time you make a decision about data. You can go out to any of the major data catalogs out there, whether you be looking at more of a kind of SQL Server specific or data, you know, specific database um, specific kind of catalog, um, or whether you're looking at kind of the big enterprise grade data catalogs who do all of the, you know, un and semi structured data. Every single one of them says the same thing. Make better decisions about your data. Know what you have and then use that information to inform decision making. Get the right data to the right people at the right time. It enables you to develop a common language, understand the nature of any given database. So for instance, this is uh, the SQL Server Management Studio 17.5 and up classifications, just our classification report, also available in Azure as well. Um, this is SQL Data Catalog's uh, classification taxonomy. And again, this is important. Don't just describe your data as sensitive or non-sensitive. Okay, sensitive data can take many forms and can be specifically sensitive for specific purposes. And you may need different treatment levels based on what data it is. Okay, sensitive or not sensitive, that does not help. Okay, but actually knowing things like, hey, um, is it a high risk database? Is it a high risk server? Um, if a developer's access, requested access to the database, can we authorize that based on the select levels that we've set about data? If we experience a data breach, which systems are the most critical? Which ones do we need to ensure have absolutely bulletproof security? And of course, who owns this data? Who's in charge of keeping it up to date? Data stewardship, all the way back to um, the actual accuracy of data and keeping things up to date. These are all important decisions we have to make. And a lot of the time, people don't have the right answers. Identify, use that information to identify how data travels within the organization. Again, in many, people's, uh, in many people's worlds, they know that data comes into the database and then data comes out of the database. And that's it. Well, I like to call it the Cotton Eye Joe principle. Um, some people like to think of it as data lineage, you know, fancy tags. Where did you come from? Is it customer data, supplier data, employee data, purchase data, market data, in what form? XLSX, Word documents, how has it been loaded? Where is it being stored? Do we know what information is coming in from where using what loading techniques, okay? Where did you come from data? And then ultimately, where did you go? Well, you end up in a black hole. You end up going into various different reporting workflows. You know, a whole bunch of people are using this in their cubes. There's Power BI reports all over the place. We've got Excel files, the worst. You know, don't get me wrong, Power BI is amazing. Excel, no. But people do just dump and back up information into various different places and have extract, tr uh, extract, uh, extract, transform and load jobs. You know, SSIS jobs, for instance, that pull information out and they'll write it to some Excel sheet somewhere and then load it back in. But what's actually happening during that process, what sensitive information is just being stuck somewhere else. Okay, we need to identify where data is used. So if you can kind of pull together this idea of data lineage, understanding where the data is coming from, where it's being, where it's going to, who's using it, then it's way easier to better understand. First of all, it's better to because we can actually say, hey, we're not just going from one place to another without knowing what's going on in the middle. But it also allows us to better understand risk.
And you can carry out risk assessments in a number of different ways. Many of the different regulations, for instance, do speculate that for high processing, um, high, high risk processing activities, um, i.e. where there's the possibility to end up in high risk to individuals, um, you should carry out a DPIA. So if you've never seen a DPIA before, it kind of looks like this. The actual processing activities are measured in a risk matrix. You know, how, what's the likelihood that something is going to go wrong and what would be the impact? Um, and it actually helps you, you use it to help describe the nature, scope, context, assess the necessity. You know, can we just bin this off? Can we find a better process, et cetera? DPIAs are a great place to get started with understanding the risk around data, but you can only do that once you know what you have, where it exists, how it is classified, who's using it, all of these sorts of things. Um, tip number four, reduce the attack surface area of data. If there are lots of places that data can be breached, it increases the likelihood significantly. So I'm not talking about holding backups of different servers in different locations necessarily, but if you have got a lot of different locations where you are, say, backing up and restoring production copies. If you are storing, you know, to make available to different teams, if you're storing backups for them to just take and consume when they need it, these sorts of things and unencrypted files on file shares, naturally, these sorts of things are actually going to end up leaving us in a non-defensible position because it's harder to patrol 500 ways that data can breach and much easier to control the 50 ways that data can be breached. Uh, defensible position tip number five, uh, de-identify data in non-production environments. This is a big one for me. This is what I spend a lot of my time talking about. Um, mask data so that you retain business logic and useful fields, but so data subjects are unidentifiable. Now you can do this a number of ways. You can actually use masking software um, like Redgate's masking software. You can use uh, DBA tools, PowerShell that has a masking component, which is mm, it's good. Um, you've got a ton of different options there, but also you can synthesize data as well. There's a ton of um, you know more basic ways of just synthesizing sample data sets, but also there are way more clever types of um, way, types of ways of generating sensitive uh, like sensitive style data out there as well, um, often using things like AI, machine learning, um, things like hazy, etc. So it enables you to retain statistical and demographic variations. There's outliers and anomalies for analytics, um, which means that you can still use data, but if data is breached, it is useless to external actors. Uh, defensible position tip number six, standardize the development process. I don't think that this one really needs that much explanation. When everybody works in the same way and you enforce coding standards, planning, progress tracking, tool sets, uh, you can better understand where in the cycle risk can come in. So it enables you to have easier levels of accountability and auditability, it enables you to track Okay, when is that vulnerability come in? It came in in version six. We can see exactly where it is in that process, who made those changes, etc. And that that kind of pairs nicely with tip seven as well. Of course, source control all of the things. Um, I hope you like my my sriracha source there. I have terrible source control. I get it all over myself and my lap and the table, um, but it's so important. Again, the reason why I pair it with the last one is. Make things fully traceable and fully understandable so that you can see a full history of all database changes. Track changes to work at a work item level using things like Jira so that you can understand, okay, in an emergency, this is how we roll back. This is what's been put at risk. And we can tie that again back to our understanding of, okay, we've had a vulnerability creep in at this point. It was tied to this work item. This person made the change. We've understood what's gone wrong. You know, we have the ability to roll back if we need to. Can we roll forwards? What is actually at risk? Let's check our, you know, listing of what is sensitive. You can make so many better decisions about that data. Naturally, I would also say automate everything where possible. Once you've got things in source control, you are just a step away from continuous integration and continuous delivery. And if you're not already doing this, um, there's a ton of different sessions going on 
at uh, Sequel Bits and also a whole bunch of other events um, during this year as well, like all the Redgate streamed events, if you want to go back and have a look at some of those. But the continuous integration stage allows us to immediately see the value of our code changes and actually detect those errors. It allows us to shift testing way left. And then once we're happy with the quality of the work we've been producing, well, we can then verify we're not breaking later stage environments, leaving them vulnerable, and we can continuously deliver or even continuously deploy them to later stages. Nine and 10 are again, fairly self-serving, fairly obvious, but always worth stating. Number one is, uh, or number nine, I should say, review your backup policies. No longer surface backups to non-relevant or unsecured environments. Um, actually upgrade or adopt stronger encryption. A lot of people are still backing up databases um, using kind of older encryption levels in third-party vendor software or actually in native as well. Sometimes um, it's better to actually review those encryption and retention policies because a lot of the legislation states that we shouldn't hold on to information for too long as well. So actually, uh, let's review, make sure we're not holding on to sensitive information longer than we need. No one is asking you to open up backups from two weeks ago, mask them and then re-back them up. That defeats the point of taking a backup. What people are saying though is, do you need to hold on to that backup for 60, 60 weeks or I don't know, uh, three years? Maybe for financial reasons, yes. But if you're just doing some transactional processing, do you need those records? Big question to ask. The final one then, monitor, monitor, monitor. See if you can say that three times fast and then backwards, monitor, monitor, monitor. Uh, losing availability of data can be considered a breach. Keep systems up. Identify and act on unusual behavior. If anything looks like it's going a bit iffy, well, it probably is. So make sure you're on top of those metrics. Um, obviously, you've got a number of great speakers here. Uh, this particular SQL Bits and every SQL Bits, actually, if you can get your hands on the recordings, people like Pinal Dave, uh, Brent Ozar, they're all going to be talking about, um, at least I think they're all talking about performance. Let's see if I can remember the schedule. Um, but they all have great tips on, on monitoring and um, identifying performance. Um, and also uh, uh, the wonderful Grant Fritchie, who I'll come on to in a second, who is who has got a couple of good sessions at SQL Bits as well. But use tools, whether, you be, whether you're using kind of SSMS or other tools, again, I'm not going to tell you what to use, but use it to spot what might be impacting those production environments, but also non-production environments. Again, talking about developers, developers need to know what impact they're going to have on later stage environments. Don't underestimate the value of monitoring pre-production environments because if you can spot deadlocks and long-running queries in test, well, actually that could be a really good mechanism for feedback for you to take back to the development teams and say, hey, we need to improve this, we need to improve this code. So a correction to my earlier statement then. What should compliance mean for development? Well, nothing, absolutely nothing, because developers shouldn't even need to think about it. Developers are focused on one thing, okay? Innovation, improving, as Donovan said, delivering value to end users. And we don't want to introduce problems for them to worry about because, you know, if you've ever, you know, you can even go on TikTok and see this as people say, you know, the amount of actual time I spend developing. And it's like tiny piece of the pie chart, if at all. We want them to focus on development. We want them to enjoy the career that they've chosen and we want them to deliver that value. It should be built into the process. We should have the ease of source controlling database changes. We should have continuous integration and continuous delivery. We should have a way of provisioning environments for our developers that don't take up lots of space, lots of time, are hard to manage. Effectively environments that are ephemeral, can be blown away at a moment's notice and are completely sanitized of sensitive information. All of these things together just provide us with a process, part of the DevOps process that keeps our developers happy 
and allows them to focus on, you know, what they should be focused on. We should give that process to them. Okay, and that's that's everyone at the company that's compliance, it's data governance, it's DBAs, it's infrastructure managers, it's development managers, testers, QA. Everyone should be working together on reducing the silos, who knows what data does what, where each data goes, everything. We should break that down and it should become part of the process. So in conclusion then, as we're about to hit the 50 minute mark, uh, everything is part of a process. By ensuring we establish, enforce, and document the right processes and procedures with the right people and tooling in place, we can ensure data is protected by design and by default. This frees up developers to innovate and deliver value to end users without adding additional worries and manual steps to their way of working. Okay, I'll let you take that one away. Now, Naturally, you may have questions, anything, anything. Feel free to tweet me. I am at plant-based sequel on Twitter. Uh, the link is right there. And I obviously blog on plantbasedsequel.com as well. You can reach out there. There's also a link to my GitHub. Um, I will be putting the slides for this presentation immediately into that GitHub as well. Um, I'll be doing that right now. Uh, and uh, please do feel free to go take them. Let me know, get in touch. Talk to me about these sorts of things. I love it. I really do. Um, but do, do not feel afraid to reach out. Now, though, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention a few other SQL Bit sessions that you should definitely check out if you get the opportunity. Go and watch the recordings, for instance. Uh, but uh, to call out specifically ones that might be relevant if you're watching this session, you've got test-driven development in SQL Server for safer code deployments obviously very very relevant with the wonderful hamish watson definitely go and check that out uh, grant fritchie uh the the wonderful the incomparable grant fritchie uh yes you should monitor as your sql database i mean you should monitor everything but definitely go and check out his session and then of course the final two as well that i mentioned and by no means is this an exhaustive list i just couldn't put them all on slides there are a billion well, there's not a billion, but there's hundreds of sessions on for SQL bits and they are all so high quality. Um, so, you know, pick, take your pick, but I would also recommend these two as well. Um, solving the DevDB problem with Docker and DBA clone. Uh, a very good friend of mine, um, Alex Yates. Yeah, you'll you'll enjoy listening to him speak. Just go. You'll prove me right. I promise. But it's a really, really good session as well. And then finally, um, one of my absolute favorite people to talk to, spend time with, um, be in Zoom meetings with, uh, have them show corgis over webcams, um, of course, is Kendra Little, uh, the fiercely, probably mostly intelligent person I've ever met in my life. Um, how to succeed on the unhappy path in database DevOps. Uh, a wealth of insights. Definitely go and check her out because um, you will always learn something from Kendra. So that's it. Thank you so much for joining uh, from myself personally right here in my dining room. Stay well, stay safe. Um, and I look forward to hopefully speaking with you in the future. And then final thank you again to all of the sponsors, all of the vendors for SQL Bits as well for making this possible. And also to everyone at the SQL Bits organizing team for doing something that seemed impossible just a few months ago, but taking a great event and making it still great just online where it's safer for everyone. So it's a huge goodbye from me, a take care, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much.